Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Hope you're there. And uh, good afternoon and uh, good evening for those who are, the time is a little bit late. I uh, hope you can all uh, see my screen and also hear me quite well. Yeah, so I'd like to start by uh, welcome you to this uh, second day of our um, um, tracker use uh, level one uh, webinar, where we are going to uh, look about DHS2 tracker, you know, a little bit of an overview and uh, features updates on what we are, we have updated on the new versions, but as well as we'll touch upon a little bit about um, the feature uh, features which we are looking about to kind of incorporate within this uh, particular application. Um, this session will be for the next um, one and a half hour to two hours, but we'll split it up, as I just said, um, halfway where we'll stop, um, hear what you have, uh, your reaction from uh, the presentation. Uh, and we encourage you to kind of uh, post all your questions in the Slack. And when the time comes, when we kind of break a bit, you could actually um, have the time to actually pose that uh, question. And uh, our facilitators, a team of facilitators here will be responding to these uh, questions. So by the way, so basically our objective for our particular um, um, webinar today is about to describe what is DHS2 Tracker. Uh, we hope that you had, um, uh, before attending this Tracker Use Level 1 Academy, you had time to go and attend some of the online uh, Track Academy, which we have. Um, so you have the basics of uh, the DHS2. So here we'll try to be more specific on describing what is DHS2 Tracker, uh, understand how DHS2 Tracker can be modified, uh, customized to fit your particular context needs, um, give a little bit of examples of how DHS2 Tracker is used. And I think for our first um, webinar, which we uh, conducted yesterday, you had time to actually see different use cases of how this DHS2 Tracker uh, has been used. And this is only specific for um, Tanzania, Uganda, uh, Rwanda, Malawi, and Kenya. But, and those were just one example from each country, but there are so many uh, use cases uh, where DHS2 tracker has been used. Uh, and then of course, we'll describe along the way uh, some of the features of DHS2 tracker, uh, which we have um, 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 available. So um, DHS2 tracker overview. So DHS2 tracker allows you to um, collect and analyze identifiable uh, individual longitudinal data. Uh, DHS2, I think we all know, um, stands for District Health Information Software 2, started with uh, collecting aggregates data. However, as it evolved, it started also to collect individual level data where you can um, uh, collect these individual uh, information um, and analyze it using a set of range of tools available within uh, the DHS2. However, you know, as you track this information, you could actually decide that this information, I want to track them through longitudinal events where this particular um, 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 case or patient um, is living through. So for example, if you have a child being immunized, you'd want to try, uh, you know, being uh, vaccinated, you want to track that particular child through different immunization stages when um, that child is born, uh, the set of doses, the set of immunization, which will go through the second visit, the third visit, etc. So we'll be tracking that particular child across different stages and set of information which we'll be tracking, which could be similar or different uh, from one visit to another. So there is how uh, DHS2 tracker uh, kind of comes in to allow for collection of these uh, uh, individual identified, individual longitudinal data. Um, that means, of course, you can create a unique set of, um, you know, unique and shared records that can relate, as I said, several services to that unique record 
your track particular tracking and as i can give you uh, as i give you the example for that particular um, child being immunized into different visits now uh, this is just a summary of uh, the tracker features which are dhs2 tracker features to be exact uh, which offers so for example, um, the tracker, DHS2 tracker feature, uh, tracker allows you to schedule visit for various services and sending automated reminders based on these schedules. So for example, I, I, I shared the example of uh, a child being immunized through different uh, visit. So you could actually schedule for this visit and luckily enough, you know exactly um, uh, these visits are scheduled um, within different weeks. So you can schedule that the next visit should be uh, X number of weeks. Um, so the client could uh, receive these uh, automated reminders through either SMS or um, um, uh, email. Then uh, the DHS2 tracker could also help you to track missed or end upcoming visits. So they can, uh, for example, healthcare workers, they could actually know um, the children, going on with a similar example I gave, can know exactly uh, how many children or which, uh, who, uh, the, the child who has missed a particular visit and also know exactly that uh, um, how many um, children are expected in the coming day uh, based on the schedule visit you should have. Of course, DHS2 Tracker can help you also uh, create reports displaying both individual identifiable information which you have uh, captured as well as aggregate data. So this is kind of a, one of the powerful um, uh, functionality of a DHS2 tracker and DHS2 in general, where you can uh, capture your information uh, at the individual level, but you can analyze your information both there at the uh, point of service as the individual, uh, you know, monitor the, the clients who you are servicing, but as well at the programmatic level where you can aggregate this information and, uh, and, and inform uh, some of your indicators which you are monitoring. Oh, uh, yeah. uh, um, seems somebody's, uh, can we all have our mics muted? Thank you. And then uh, DHS2 Tracker can uh, support also um, data quality uh, functionalities as well as uh, decision support during data collection. That is, um, if you have any logical uh, pro, uh, logics uh, through your data collection, skip logics, uh, then DHS2 can uh, accommodate those uh, skip logics uh, to allow you uh, a more robust uh, process of data entry and you know, uh, limit errors, data, uh, data, data entry errors. Uh, of course, uh, that means your information becomes more of a high quality and of course, um, uh, um, you know, supporting the information use processes. And as I said before, you can also uh, use DHS2 Tracker to send notification alert based on the data within each individual uh, event. So for example, uh, if you have collected a particular information, uh, right now we have uh, um, a, a huge case, I think yesterday we had a a use case where we are talking about COVID-19 um, certification, vaccination. Um, so when you, you, you are vaccinated, you are fully vaccinated, uh, the information is entered into the system, then um, you know, uh, there, there could be a notification or alerts scheduled, uh, generated to inform a particular individual, particular clients that you know, either your certificates are ready, you can access them, you know, at a certain position, certain location, etc. So these are notification alert based on the data which has been um, entered into a specific event within uh, uh, DHS2 tracker. So that's um, that's on the data entry, data collection, but also you could um, it, it it supports also the analysis part, and this this is where it gets more fun. That is, you don't only use this uh, DHS2 tracker to collect information, but rather also uh, to analyze the information which you have collected. So you have collected your information at the individual level, but this information can be automatically aggregated uh, based on the predefined uh, parameters through your either program indicators, 
um, or, or, or through these uh, DHS2 analytical tools. So this is something which is very powerful in terms of, uh, you know, within the DHS2 tracker, where you can have these uh, information as quickly as possible, uh, you know, from the individual level to the aggregate level. Uh, yeah, and then of course you can uh, you can both have these individual aggregate tracker. The data can be viewed in these uh, different uh, DHS two analytical tools, you know, such as dashboards, tables, charts, and math. There are a variety of analytic analytics tools which are there. It's you uh, and your you know system of administrators, system of uh, users who can configure these things. Uh, make sure that you can view this information, um, you know, at the fly. And also, um, you can also, uh, the DHS2 tracker can also support um, exportation of these uh, data to any analytical platform of your choice. You can download these um, uh, data through a common format, for example, um, you know, CSV files, but you can also uh, see how you can export this information through um, different uh, mechanisms. So when we talk about, uh, as I said, uh, DHS2 track, um, you know, helps you to collect your individual uh, level data. So when we go to uh, an individual level data, uh, the aspect of privacy uh, is, 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 uh, is a concern. So um, DHS2 uh, allows you or contains these granular sharing settings that allow your system administrator to define which organization levels, um, which, uh, user, which groups, uh, which individual users or which in, uh, user groups can, you know, can access, access specific kinds of data stored within the uh, tracker program. Later on in our presentation, we'll kind of uh, display or show you a little bit of that aspect where one can either view uh, a particular record but could not you know, enter this information uh, the other one could not even register uh, this information within the tracker. So these are kind of a, a set of, uh, uh, um, I would say, sharing setting or access level, which DHS2 can be uh, customized to allow that only uh, individuals who are supposed to view a certain individual information can view them. Only individuals who are supposed to create or register this information, they can uh, they can be able to register this particular information. So that's, uh, that's something which uh, is quite important when you are dealing with uh, individual level information. Also, uh, hosting of uh, DHS2 instance is handled by own organization who define their own parameters of data storage, you know, depending on uh, local laws and privacy uh, concerns. So if your organization, for example, your Ministry of Health, um, is comfortable to host a DHS2 instance within their, uh, you know, organizational uh, data center, then it's fine. If it's, uh, they are hosting it within uh, the national data center, that is fine. But also if it's um, uh, hosted uh, on the cloud, that, that is something which the own organization needs to make uh, a decision on where do we want to host uh, our DHS2 which will host an individual uh, our data. And even if um, you host it uh, in the cloud um, national data center uh, or within your own offices, uh, access, uh, access to this particular database and the data, data itself in, within will be limited to who you provide access to. So this is something which is very important um, uh, to, to, to kind of underline this, that the owner of the database is you, the person or the organization uh, or the institution, which is um, you know, hosting uh, this uh, database and running this database. Now, that means that you might need to make sure that you have a clear SOP to make sure that uh, you know, who access what and when and, and et cetera. So those are very key um, uh, aspects. Then, of course, uh, you know, when you decide to host uh, this DHS2 um, uh, tracker, um, the configuration of that is, um, is um, uh, others could say pretty much straightforward, but others could, be, uh, could also have a different opinion. However, um, the DHS2 team or the HISP team has, uh, kind of um, come up with approach 
where you can have a, a number of standard digital packages, uh, you know, configurable digital packages, which can be as a starting point uh, of starting, you know, collecting certain particular uh, information. So for example, the HISP uh, community has been working with these uh, global uh, international organizations such as WHO to establish these standard packages, for example, for malaria, uh, for immunization, um, uh, malaria, TB, HIV, and also for immunization, where you can you can have a set of um, you know predefined uh, metadata ready to be uh, imported or uh, inserted within the your DHS two instance, and you can start running uh, those or start collecting those information, but following the uh, standard international standard which has been set there. Of course, if your country or your organization has deviated a bit from the standard uh, data collection processes uh, which have been set there, then there might need to be a further customization of these particular uh, packages. So some of the international partners which uh, the HISP network has uh, collaborated to um, uh, customize uh, these uh, standard digital packages include WHO, as I said, CDC, UNICEF, Gavi, uh, and et cetera. So that's, that's, that's uh, one way. But of course, um, if you have a use case which is quite uh, intriguing and you think that this is, um, you know, oh, at least, um, you know, there is uh, something which is uh, you want to use, a use case which you want to use uh, DHS to tracker, then uh, feel free to reach to the network and, uh, you know, um, 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 you know, explain your use case. I uh, believe some of the people within the network might help to uh, 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 advise you how you can configure that as well. So um, where we have come from and where we are so far, um, as I said before, DHS2 started as an aggregate system, collecting aggregate data, but it evolved to uh, collect individual um, um, level data. And um, currently we have over 75 countries including uh, and Indian states, which are using DHS to track. And as the graph there shows, there have been re in recent years, I think five to six years ago, there have been a huge kind of um, uh, uh, push to, um, um, to collect these individual data. And as you can see from 2015, 2014, 2015, then the, the, the kind of, uh, the graph kind of uh, started to rise up. Uh, as more countries started to, you know, explore um, the possibilities of collecting individual data, individual level data using DHS2 uh, tracker. Um, even if uh, your country is, uh, have deployed DHS2 aggregate, then there's a huge potential for you to also scale it down to the lower level where you can also collect individual, um, you know, individual level data um, without, of course, additional software platform to engage with. Of course, it might need to, you know, a little bit of customization to fit um, to, to that particular use case which you want. Of course, some capacity building and, and support. But uh, as I said before, uh, if you're using aggregate uh, system right now, uh, feel free to reach to the community uh, where, um, where you can be advised on how best you can uh, scale um, um, your implementation from the aggregate uh, to the uh, individual level. And as you see, there's a huge um, number of uh, use cases there, a huge number of users who are operating their DHS2 um, uh, tracker. So um, in summer, there are several core apps features related to DHS2 tracker um, on the aspect of data collection. Uh, this presentation will be covering, you know, uh, some of the um, tools, for example, uh, capture app, uh, tracker capture, and also these are two apps, capture and tracker capture, these are on the web uh, end, but also uh, we have also our mobile Android capture app, which uh, mostly allow us to um, capture uh, in information. Then of course, for the uh, output anal analysis end, we have also you know, different um, DHS2 apps, features, for example, charts, tables, uh, maps, dashboard, where it integrates different 
uh, analytics uh, tools uh, to allow you to view this information in one particular uh, place. Not that uh, you know every release of DHS2 involve updates of these particular tools. Um, so what we are presenting here is uh, you know um, the the features which you can. Um, I see in the very latest uh, uh, DHS2 uh, version. Um, yeah, so you might see something here which is not maybe um, you know accommodated in uh, um, a DHS2 tracker of uh, of a previous version. So that's something which you should not. And of course, as I said before, later we'll also discuss uh, some of the uh, features which we want also to incorporate. In the future, uh, in the future DHS2 uh, tracker. So uh, I'll jump straight to uh, the. Uh, we'll start with the data collection processes. We'll start with the uh, capture app. So um, I, I hope uh, you are familiar with this capture app. Uh, this capture app has um, evolved um, through a number of iterative um, uh, uh, processes. Um, right now, this particular capture app uh, is able or facilitates, uh, can, can allow you to register new tracked entity instances and enroll, uh, enroll them into program. So I think this is quite a revolution where you have a one, this uh, capture app where you can, uh, um, you can include, um, you know, or you can register a new track entity instance. Um, for example, if um, um, I give you an example of a child child immunization program uh, where you want to monitor, monitor these uh, uh, children through different visits, so your tracked and the instance will be those uh, you know children who you will be uh, monitoring them through uh, specific uh, visits. So this capture app allows you to do that. Previously, it was um, you know registering on the event uh, based um, uh, data. But right now it com, uh, uh, registers also uh, a new track entity instances. Also, this app can allow you to search for track entity instances uh, and, of course, uh, list and filter track entity instances in track programs. So, this is kind of uh, um, putting um, um, your track entity instances or your individual level information into one app where it's possible for users to capture this information, regardless of a program or type of program which you have. If that program, it's uh, you know, tracking clients longitudinal, or if that particular program is only based on particular one event. Yes. So um, this is uh, um, uh, uh, one feature which we, uh, the latest features which we want to discuss here is this integration of events and tracker data capture. Like I said before, the capture app previously was only uh, capturing the events. For example, if you have a program monitoring, you know, mortality, you know, for example, death, uh, for example, this year we have inpatient mobility and mortality you're only registering that particular patient or client once. So once they come to a um, service uh, point of service, you record, okay, uh, this particular person has come, um, he has either, if there is, it's, uh, it's about mortality, then you say that, okay, um, time of death, uh, you know, um, cause of death and et cetera, all this information, and of course, the personal information of that particular person. So you don't expect to record uh, additional information, you know, or, or you have another visit of that particular person if that person is 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 has uh, uh, has faced some um, mortality issues. So that's a more or less event. It's more or less kind of a collecting individual level data, but you're collecting it uh, at that particular event. However, um, you know, previously, like I said, uh, Capture App was capturing this information, but now it has um, um, shifted to also include or uh, integrate to capture also the tracker, uh, the tracker or the longitudinal uh, data which you want to monitor. And the example which I gave you was, for example, a child program where you want to, you know, um, uh, monitor this particular child uh, coming to a particular facility 
and you want to monitor that particular child through different visits, you know, getting uh, different immunization um, or, or vaccination, uh, for example, BCG, um, you know, OPV, uh, later on measles, and et cetera. So now within the uh, DHS2 capture app, you can both um, have a program which is an event based and also a program which is a tracker um, or tracking and information longitudinal through different visits. Then, of course, uh, the Capture app uh, is now uh, accommodating pattern-based ID generation. This is something which uh, it has been requested uh, for, for a long time, where you can um, uh, uh, have a pattern-based uh, ID generation, where when you are registering a person, you can customize your, your app so that it can you know, uh, generate uh, a unique ID for that particular patient. Uh, or client, but this particular unique ID can should follow a specific uh, a pattern. So uh, based on certain criteria or parameters which we have kind of identified. So this is something which uh, you can uh, configure within the uh, DHS2 capture app here, as you can see in this particular example, where you enter or you are starting to register, um, you know, your tracked instance or your patient, your client, and then the unique ID, um, you know, uh, generates here based on the parameters which you have uh, uh, specified. Then, of course, you can, uh, uh, the Capture app can also uh, help you with a duplicate detection during the data entry, during the registration. So this is quite important because, you know, you can, um, you, you, you can actually enter uh, information of the patient, a client, and then that particular client is already uh, registered within the system. So uh, the, the DHS2 capture can, you know, when you're registering, it can check based on the information which is uh, existing within the database and then uh, give you a notification um, for a possible uh, duplicate, of course, ask you uh, if you want to proceed or, of course, if you want, first of all, if you want to view uh, to confirm the duplication, and of course, if you want to proceed, if you think um, um, the duplication, there is no duplication in the information which you have registered. Okay, so um, th that was our DHS2 capture app. Then, of course, um, we'll talk a little bit more about DHS2 tracker capture app as well. So as you can see here on my left here, there's a tracked entities dashboard uh, and tracked entity dashboard, which kind of displays uh, basic information of this particular person. So once you're registered, uh, you register or enroll, uh, when you enroll a particular person uh, to a particular program uh, at a particular uh, health facility, then this, uh, this dashboard, the individual, the tracked entity dashboard becomes available where you can see some of the basic information uh, of that particular person, but also you can also continue with uh, uh, managing uh, or monitoring some of the indicators uh, which uh, this particular person um, has, but also you can manage the data entry processes and, and also view some of other features which I'll talk about a little bit. Yeah, so um, this is uh, this is the um, tracked entity dashboard. As you can see, different information. For example, here it shows the enrollment information, which I said. So it tells you, you know, where this particular uh, client or patient is enrolled. When was he enrolled? You know, if there's any um, other programs. For example, here um, you you can see that this particular program is also enrolled in another program. So here. Uh, at the top, you'll see, of course, the name of the current program, the COVID-19, for this case, the COVID-19 case-based surveillance. But of course, you'll see that this particular person is also enrolled uh, in another program, as you can see it uh, here. Of course, here uh, on the right, there is a profile where you can see uh, basic information of that particular tract entity um, instance. But you can, if you want to view uh, the full list, you can actually uh, toggle here, uh, click the edit, and then you can see the full list. Uh, you can also uh, view and manage relationship of this particular uh, tract entity. So relationship is linking between one tract, uh, tract entity instance to another based on a certain relationship. Could be, you know, mother to child, 
um, or it could be for this case of COVID-19, it could be, you know, a suspect to a contact tracing uh, 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 and et cetera. So the relationship, all of these are customizable. You can customize and then you can actually start to add these relationships here. So you can manage the relationship of the tracked entity instance here through the uh, tracked entity uh, dashboard. And of course, as I said here, you can see uh, the indicators, uh, configured indicators for this particular uh, tracked entity instance. For this uh, example, we have the patient age here, 41 years, plus one day. Uh, and of course, if you had additional indicators, they'll be listed here. And whenever you enter your information, these indicators will be um, updated um, here. Uh, of course, uh, as I said, you could also continue with your uh, data entry uh, through different stages um, where you have access to. Okay, so um, um, one of the um, uh, key feature which has been accommodated is to allow you to compare repeatable events during data entry. Now, as I said, DHS2 Tracker allows you to track your information across different uh, visits. And there was a need to actually, you know, when uh, a, a health worker or at the service point of entry there, when you're entering data for existing visit, you should be able to view a previous visit and, you know, try to compare uh, or triangulate some of the information which you're entering now versus the uh, what was entered uh, or what was shared in the previous uh, visit. So um, uh, the, the, the tracker capture now allows you to, um, you know, enter your information, uh, the current um, uh, um, um, data entry. Then, of course, you can uh, view or you can compare this with the uh, information which was entered into the previous visit. So for this particular example, we have here an antenatal um, program where it monitors pregnant women, you know, um, through different antenatal visits, the first one, the second one, the third one, the fourth one, uh, until um, um, that pregnant woman delivers, and then, of course, uh, could be shifted to another uh, program. So for here, we have, um, for example, here we are just showing you um, um, the data entry for the antenatal second visit where you are entering uh, this information, but you can actually see um, uh, antenatal information which has been entered at the antenatal first visit. Um, and then of course, um, you know, you can compare uh, what information you are entering now vis-a-vis -vis, uh, what was entered, um, you know, previous visit and, you know, make some uh, uh, informed decision through that particular process. Yes, um, then of course, our track, uh, DHS2 Tracker Capture um, allows you to uh, share metadata and data, share, uh, share metadata and data. And these are, this is a quite a broad concept in terms of uh, access uh, of information um, uh, within the DHS2 Tracker app. Now, for example, um, and this is quite important because we are dealing with individual level data, so it's important to actually have a robust system which uh, allows you to have controls, who can see what, when, and et cetera. So for example, uh, the DHS2 tracker capture allows you to control who can register information. So you can have a user, uh, a group of user uh, within your organization who you have uh, entrusted them to you know, register Enter information, individual level information for your particular uh, program uh, and plan. So th that partic those particular user group, you can you know um, customize well within the DHS to, to say that you know for this particular um, particular uh, user group or users, they are able to um, register and other users. Uh, who do, do not belong in that particular user group or are not assigned to that um, privilege, then they will not be able to create uh, or register uh, patients or clients within that particular program. And this could be based by program and program. For example, uh, you can have immunization officers, uh, you know, at the facility level uh, being given access to register clients 
um, you know, um, their clients are in the child health program. But you also have malaria, um, uh, for example, good, um, uh, maybe uh, you have a disease surveillance officers uh, who are working with the, for example, another program, COVID-19 surveillance, then you, they are only monitoring or they are only um, able to register uh, suspects or clients um, in a different program uh, from that uh, child health, um, child health um, program. So that's, uh, that's one aspect where you can look at it. Uh, then you can actually control access to specific program stages within uh, a specific uh, program. So I could give you an example of um, COVID-19 um, surveillance uh, program where you, you know, um, once you have a suspect, you need to register that particular suspect. Um, and then, of course, to you know, confirm that particular suspect, you need to take a sample, uh, send it to the lab. Uh, the lab needs to test that particular sample. And then, of course, I uh, give you the result. If it's a positive, then that suspect um, uh, turns to be a case. And then, of course, you need to you know, um, place him uh, into case management where there's a different team working um, uh, you know, uh, with that particular case. Um, and of course, different team working with the contract tracing um, uh, of that particular case, um, COVID-19 case. So you have different teams working together uh, in a particular one program. So, um, so in that case, you could have a, a team uh, working with, you know, um, at, for example, port of entry or the facility where they can gather this information, they can identify the suspect and register them. So you can actually create a user group and assign them a control access to enter or to register this information and also populate this information in the stages where they are supposed to, for example, you know, collecting the basic information. But you could also um, customize your system to allow that the lab team um, only view a stage where they can see the request for the lab uh, as well as enter information for you know, the result of the test as well. So that is something which you can create uh, within your system where uh, people can only um, um, uh, access the specific stage. And of course, the same can be done for contact tracing. Uh, the same can be done for case management in that particular example, that only uh, the, the, the team, the user, the team are assigned to specific um, roles or specific stages within the bigger state, uh, within a bigger program where they only are uh, able to enter information based on uh, what they can, um, they, can, they can access. And then of course, you can control who can access the data in the analysis app. This is of course, something very important that you know, it's not only at the data collection point, but also at the you know, use that you need also to uh, make sure that you um, control who um, is able to view what particular set of data. If you have multiple program within your national um, uh, you know, instance, national database, uh, then you can actually decide that you know, analytically, yes, the information is entered at the facility level uh, where you have you know, a, a small number, a team where they enter this, all this information from, from different programs, for example, HIV, uh, malaria, uh, maternal and child, and et cetera. But at the national level, you want, you know, uh, the national HIV program, uh, national AIDS control program to actually view only their set of indicators and data. That is something which you can also uh, uh, configure within your um, analysis, analytics apps. So this is an example of uh, what I was, uh, I was um, uh, uh, explaining that um, there are users who you can configure and then they are able to enter this information, uh, individual level information uh, directly, directly into the data entry uh, section. But some other people will not be able to view this information, as you can see here. This person uh, is able to view, but is not able to enter this information, even though this particular visit is open, but this particular person has, does not have the access um, to um, uh, enter this information. 
Then um, uh, DHS2 tracker uh, capture allows you to persist the top bar while entering uh, uh, your information. So the top bar is this, uh, you know, the, uh, the, this uh, gray bar here, where it have these uh, attributes, information of that uh, tracked instance, the information which you, um, you know, registered uh, when you are enrolling that particular person. So sometimes, uh, when you have uh, registered and enrolled that particular person, you might come and you know continue to enter data for this particular um, attractor into the instance, and you might need to kind of cross check or um, to see uh, to, to to know which uh, I mean, am I entering information at the you know right profile, right client? So you can configure your app where this uh, top bar. Uh, can be persisted and you know you can continue to enter your data while this top uh, um, you know uh, hovers um, within your particular app even though you scroll down so this is something which is uh, quite um, relevant uh, especially on the data data entry uh, part then of course um, another function which is um, uh, um, quite quite um, innovative uh, but I'm not so sure if a lot of people are using it um, you know this uh, breaking the glass so um, you know to ensure confidentiality to ensure that uh, you know the right person can access um, you know can view um, only the information which they are supposed to you know there's a there's a need to kind of uh, set some barriers set some uh, controls in, in a way that, you know, uh, one, one person can search, can view, can access other information. And also importantly, to put audit, you know, uh, trails where you can know um, who has been searching for what and why. I think these are, these are uh, very key uh, in, in information. So for example, I could give you an example that for uh, a health worker in a particular facility, um, is trying to either find an information uh, of a client which is not uh, based on that particular facility or in a different, uh, you know, registered in a different facility. So DHS2 allows you to search for that particular person, but you can actually put in place some controls um, where you can monitor who searches what uh, and for what particular, you know, for what particular reason. So for example, uh, this customization, you can, you know, set this customization to be either open, uh, audited, predicted, or closed. If you uh, say this is, um, you know, um, this is um, closed, then of course uh, that particular person or the health worker cannot, of course, search for these records in, uh, in, 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 uh, in, in, the, in those other facilities. But if you can say open, then that particular worker can search and access you know this particular information but uh once you you know put it here audited or protected then when the health worker searches for that particular you know record then they'll be you know prompted uh with this particular dialogue here that you know this tract entity instance belongs to another organization unit you know uh please fill in the reason for accessing your action is being you know monitored so that, first of all, tells uh, the health workers that, you know, the system is um, quite comprehensive and monitors um, um, most of the action which are happening uh, within the system. But also the health worker could also, you know, um, enter this information uh, and, and, and allow for uh, a record to be shared or to be accessed across different facilities. And I think this is something which is quite uh, innovative in its own way. Then of course, um, uh, the DHS2 tracker uh, capture app uh, allows you to, you know, um, trace uh, to find this uh, audit history um, of who did what, when, and those kind of things, you know. Um, and and this is quite important when you're running, for example, your organizational database, your national database, where you have so many users, so many things happening. Um, so having a, a proper uh, audit history where you can track all this information is quite useful. So for example, here you could actually track um, uh, audit history for, you know, um, um, track instance attributes. So, and of course, uh, data elements. So for the attributes, attributes are these values 
uh, which we capture when we are registering a tracker entity instance, you know, for example, uh, first name, uh, last name, you know, date of birth, gender, and et cetera. So you could actually track who has changed, you know, uh, have they created, have they updated, you know, have they deleted those kind of things. And, you know, uh, uh, um, it puts, of course, here the date, uh, the date and time of these particular uh, uh, changes. And then, of course, uh, we have the data element. These are the values which we capture in the follow-up visits. Um, and, and you could also, you know, capture this information as well um, uh, whenever they are created or updated, you know, and who has updated that, as I said, um, and, and, and of course, the data. Um, guys, um, the mics, um, please let's mute our mics. Okay, then of course you, uh, the DHS2 tracker capture can allow you to, you know, um, a shift between several data entry modes, depending on the program requirement, the user preferences. So some users uh, like to enter the information in the timeline base where they can view or they can see, uh, they can be able to, you know, toggle between, you know, previous visit uh, and the uh, current visit easily, as you can see here. Uh, where you have uh, different boxes uh, showing you the timeline, uh, where you have the ANC registration, the ANC visit, for example, first one, second one, and continuous. And then you can, um, you know, these boxes have different colors showing you different stages um, uh, of, um, of, of that particular program. Then, of course, you can enter your information here uh, as, as you, can, you can see, and then you can toggle between these particular visits uh, as easy as that. So that that could be one, sorry, that could be one way of looking at it. But you know, uh, sometimes you could actually uh, have other who wants to have you know enter the information row by row, as you can see here, where you can enter your information uh, instead of like a, you know uh, the, the previous uh, screen which I showed you. You can have it here as um, as 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 a row by row where you can enter this information uh, for the first registration, NC registration, the follow-up visit, and then of course you can complete them as it is. These are more or less uh, user, uh, user preferences, how they want to change uh, their particular view um, and et cetera. And of course uh, here, you, uh, this is uh, you know, similar to what I have said. Then, of course, you can decide to have uh, a more tabular data entry. And um, this is, a uh, um, important if you have, you know, different stages and number of stages which you want to kind of monitor throughout, then you can, you know, can have this tabular data entry uh, view where you can have all your stages here, as you can see, and then uh, you enter your information. So that's, uh, that could be also uh, another mechanism of, um, uh, of entering your data. These are all um, um, different uh, data entry modes, which you can configure within your system to make sure that uh, your user um, 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 are getting a user-friendly interface uh, to enter this information. Then of course, we have um, uh, user assignments of events and custom working list management. So um, we talked a little bit about this, that you can assign um, users to a particular events within your particular um, uh, stage or uh, within your program. And then of course that particular user uh, could be assigned to this and work in that. However, you could also um, you know, uh, assign or customize the working list uh, for those particular users so that they can view um, a, a certain, you know, they can view a list based on what they, they want to do. So for, uh, for, for a good, um, for example, you can have uh, a, user, a user group or users who you want to customize or you want to create a custom working list that you want only to view uh, the current information or you want to view a certain un uncompleted information so that you can, um, you can view uh, 
um, tractant in instance which are either complete or which are not complete or which are current registered within your system. So this, this list will be kind of, you know, here top of uh, um, uh, the interface when this particular user comes to the DHS2 tracker capture app, then they can see this particular, you know, they can see the list based on this custom uh, working list which you have uh, designed for them. So this gives them a little bit of um, a powerful way of uh, either, you know, viewing attract uh, entity instance which have been registered, which are of their particular um, need for that particular time. Then, of course, uh, I mentioned this a little bit uh, when we were going through the tracked entity instance dashboard that um, you can create relationship um, uh, between one tracked entity uh, instance to another. And this relationship, you know, can be a mother to child. Uh, it could be, you know, um, a, a suspect or a case, uh, COVID-19 uh, case to, you know, the contacts uh, which he has been um, in contact with in the recent days. So, you know, the, 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 the examples or the use cases could be varying for um, depending on a program and a program. So um, this relationship can be added uh, as easily. And of course, one thing, when you are in the tracked entity instance dashboard, you can see this um, 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 relationship, but also you can see the, uh, the contact uh, which you have uh, linked with. So for example, this year you see this person has a contact with Sarah and James. And how you can do this, um, you can you know, add, uh, it's, it's quite straightforward. You can, you know, add and then you get presented with a dialogue box where you can search for another tract entity instance within the database, or you can register a new um, um, profile or, or, or patient or class. Then um, 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 that particular person will be linked um, to your, to your, um, then, of course, um, I mentioned this a little bit. Uh, there's somebody with a mic on. Please mute your mic. So um, then we have this enroll entities in multiple programs. That is, a, a, pro a person can be in one uh, program, uh, but you can um, you can allow allow for that particular person to register into a different uh, a different program and this is can be done directly um, in the in that particular track instance uh, um, dashboard uh, Then of course, um, there is a show live indicators, program data values. These are also um, uh, uh, hinted when I was going through the uh, track instance to the dashboard that you can have these uh, live indicators displaying some information which you want to track as you enter information for that particular uh, client uh, or a profile, then these information are, are updated and you can you know, monitor these indicators um, and of course, the, uh, uh, for example, or if there's any feedback, then you can monitor them as well here. Then, of course, the DHS2 tracker capture can, you know, allow you to schedule visit and track these uh, visits and their status as well. Um, you know, you can schedule for a visit, for example, if a person, if a child is vaccinated, uh, you know, uh, in the first once they are, you know, um, born, then they uh, there are certain kind of uh, uh, doses which they are given there uh, within two to three days. But uh, you know, they are scheduled to receive other vaccination in the, you know, in the next visit. So you can reschedule this particular visit uh, there. But as well as you can also track this particular visit and see the uh, status that uh, if uh, they are missed or um, they have attended, or if they delayed attending um, uh, in their visits, you know, and et cetera. So those are kind of things which you can, uh, um, you can, you can, uh, you can track, but as well, uh, not only tracking, but you can also send reminders uh, to these scheduled visits uh, to the, um, you know, clients, uh, patients, but also send notification 
based on the occurrence within an event. So for example, here, um, there's a, 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 a message here from the lab. For example, this is a message from the lab, which says the lab result of uh, uh, you know, uh, unique um, identification already at uh, CHW mouth sort. Please log into DHS2 in order to view the final lab uh, results. So this is uh, um, a way of uh, you know, notifying a person through either this is an email, but you can also uh, send this um, uh, notification through an SMS as well, um, either by when uh, a certain occurrence is happening in a stage, for example, here the values has been entered into that particular lab stage, or based on the scheduled visit, you can schedule that, for example, two days or three days before a visit, you can notify the client that, okay, in the next two days, you're supposed to come to visit to a particular clinic. Uh, please, um, you know, come with uh, certain, um, either your identification and uh, other um, materials which you are required to, um, to come with to the, to the clinic. So these are things which you can configure into the system and, um, um, and send them to the client. Then of course, um, uh, speaking of data quality, uh, improving data quality, uh, adding a little bit of uh, decision support within the system, uh, the DHS2 tracker app can allow you to do this. Um, um, basically, yes. So here you can uh, see this example where um, um, you have um, uh, different vaccine and the different vaccine I uh, have a different approaches. Um, these are different COVID-19 vaccine and the different vaccine have um, uh, different manufacturers uh, information, different batch lot number, uh, you know, different um, uh, uh, vaccine expiration date, but as well as the schedule for the next dose. There are some vaccinations which, you know, have one, you can only have one dose, uh, the j and but other vaccination uh, requires you to have more than one dose, um, uh, but their schedule is quite different. So uh, DHS2, DHS2 tracker capture can um, uh, allow you to configure these keep logics and understand that whenever you have um, uh, selected the vaccine to be given, for example, in this case, Astra, as an echo, then it will, you know, um, uh, identify that, okay, the next dose will be, you know, uh, which date, but when you have selected a specific manufacturer, then it will understand, okay, uh, the batch lot number is this one and the expiration date is this one. These are information which you have kind of pre-populated uh, within your particular uh, system based on certain um, program rules which you have, uh, you have identified. So this helps of course, to improve the quality of information uh, captured within the system, um, but also elevate some of the workload uh, at the point of entry. Yes, and of course, uh, if there is any information uh, which is um, of a concern, then uh, the DHS2 tracker capture can, you know, uh, give you feedback in terms of either warning or error of uh, the particular value uh, which you have entered. Um, and this is, is quite important because sometimes you might, you know, the health workers uh, can enter some information, um, but, um, you know, uh, once you have these data quality checks, then it, uh, it, will, it will kind of improve the quality of information which is entered. So for this example, um, um, you know, there is a feedback uh, here saying that this client has received their last dose Please consider completing the stage and, uh, and, and, and program. And this is based on, you know, once you have checked here that, okay, uh, here, this is the last dose uh, this particular client has received based on that particular type of uh, uh, vaccination. Okay. So before jumping to DHS to Android, uh, let me stop here. And um, welcome some of the questions which um, participants might have. Um, if there is um, um, participants who have um, 
a burning question. Uh, maybe you can um, raise up your hand. I'm trying to look here to the our question to see if there is any question, a question channel in the Slack um, to see if there is any question. Okay, so I see here there's some question, but uh, does the pattern-based ID generation work for event program? I'm currently 2.35 version. I'm wondering if that is possible in that particular version, um, but our facilitators have also responded. Uh, this is for the benefit of all. Let me just read the response. Uh, thanks for this question. The pattern and its uniqueness is based on attribute, which are only available in the tracker not event programs. You can, however, use program rules to create the pattern by assigning to a data element, but won't achieve uniqueness in, in, in event. So that's, uh, that's uh, um, partly uh, some of the questions which I've seen. Um, I have not seen a hand so far. Um, if we have any participants who would like to react or ask a question directly, we welcome, but we need you to raise your hand first. Um, okay, somebody was having a challenge about uh, the Slack channel. I hope um, we have shared the Slack channel, I think um, now you can be able to go to our Slack channel and go to the question and uh, respond there. Okay, um, so we have a few questions here. One says, my amico Mendamenda says, um, okay, um, on the, uh, thank you for, for this helpful presentation. On the capture app, what properties are being looked for during the duplication detection? Is it only the first and last name or all the user details? Now to allow this to, um, to make it more interactive, let me welcome some of uh, my um, colleagues here to respond to, you, to, to, to this particular question so that you can also hear their names, uh, hear their voices as well. I hope you're not uh, tired with hearing my voice. Any response from uh, the facilitators? Yes, Wilfred, I would like to respond to the questions that have been asked on the Slack channel. One is asking if at all we're going to learn on how to use these features that have just been presented. And the response is yes, starting from Monday, we'll be looking on these different tracker features, how to use them, and of course, even the analytical part of it. And there's also another question asking, when do we use tracker capture or capture itself? So I think at some point, Wilfred had mentioned that tracker capture is sort of phasing out where previously tracker capture was specifically for tracker related data, meaning that uh, you're tracking data that it sort of has a continuation. It's not just a one occurrence data. And the capture itself was used to capture event related data, meaning that it's one time data. It doesn't have a sequence or a follow up. But uh, moving, uh, moving forward, the tracker capture is phasing out. And the idea is to have a single capture app that will be able to incorporate both tracker data as well as event data. So I would welcome other facilitators if at all we have more additional points. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this is Prosper, uh, KSP Uganda. 
Yeah, just to take on the question about duplication, uh, and I just to um, to go back on the question and be, be able to understand what you're asking. And I think here you are either asking in relationship to in relation to data entry. So you want to capture duplicates as you enter your data. You want to see if the record has has been entered before or not by just based on the uniqueness that you have defined in your system. If that's the question, uh, the, the answer would be, no, it's not restricted to the first and last name. Uh, still there, it could have, you could have multiple attributes because here we're looking at attributes that will be able to help you to uh, specify your uniqueness of your record. So you could have multiple records. You could have um, uh, probably a, a unique identifier, which is pattern driven as Wilfred has shown you. And once you enter into the system, then you will be able to see that. Um, I mean, when once you enter a second record, then it will be able to compare with what has been entered before. Uh, and these settings, again, we shall be able to see them in the training next week that you can set it that it's unique within the entire system system and that means from facility to facility or unique within your, 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 your facility and once that is done then the uniqueness will be based on the attributes that you have selected uh, not necessarily the first name and, and last name that is to the understanding that I reflect the question that you have asked thank you over thank you Adija and uh, Prosper for uh, those were uh, elaborative um, uh, response. Yes, my, my amico has um, uh, responded and said that, yes, that was indeed um, the question which was asked. Um, just to involve other uh, facilitators as well, I will uh, read two more questions and then we'll continue with our presentation. The first question is, when do we choose tracker capture or capture and why? This is from Jean Powell. And then um, uh, the second question is for the different data entry interface, is this something that has to be defined during configuration and cannot be changed afterwards? Or is this something that could be changed during data entry as the encoder prefers? Mm. All right, uh, this is uh, Tuwange. So I think the, the first question was already responded to in terms of the, 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 the capture, the tracker capture and the, and the capture. And for the views, those can be switched at, at entry in terms of whether you want that other standard view or the, or the tabular view. So one can yeah, switch. And I think I also see in here, there's a, a question on the building uh, reports indicators in the, in the tracker. I assume that talks about, I think configuration of uh, program indicators for analysis. Is, is that correct? So if it's, it's that, uh, there's a, a data session within the academy, I think that talks about uh, indicators. So I think that would be visited then. But uh, in short, there's a maintenance section within the DHIS2 platform. And under maintenance, there's a component called uh, indicators and there you can access program indicators where you can uh, do the configuration of the specific uh, indicators, mapping them to the data elements for which you are collecting data. Yeah, so I think that's what I can say in short. Thank you, Tiwonge. And I would just like to build up on what Tiwonge has said. Uh, speaking of program indicators uh, configuration, there's a separate academy for that. But for this academy, we'll be focusing more on how to use whatever that has already been configured into the system. So there will be a, a session on how to use program indicators, but more details on configuration that will be covered into tracker configuration indicator. Uh, 
Um, thank you, Hadija and um, Kiwonge for um, responding to a participant's question. Um, I was um, thinking of, you know, we could have a live um, question from a participant, but I think if you have any question, uh, as I said before, please write it down on the Slack, but we'll uh, try as much as possible to have um, um, a chance where you can ask your question at the end of this uh, particular um, um, particular um, uh, session webinar. So um, let's continue with our our, our um, um, you know presentation on the DHS two tracker features, an overview, and uh, you know some of the features, key features which um, um, are available there. I'm hoping that you can still see my screen. Um, yeah, so we have covered uh, more on the web. Uh, DHS to capture app, DHS to track a capture, how you can, you know, and different features where you can capture this information. You can maintain the quality of the information which you are capturing, but as also you can, you know, uh, send some notifications, some reminders um, uh, to your clients and etc. Now we are shifting gears to the um, uh, mobile, uh, mobile, um, application where we have a DHS to Android uh, base where it, um, um, it has also gone through different maturity uh, stages uh, now allowing you to work you know with aggregate event and track adapter on your mobile phone and uh, this view of course uh, you can uh, both have it while you have the connectivity but also uh, even storing uh, this information uh, within the uh, computer, uh, sorry, within your mobile uh, memory. So meaning that it works also offline. Um, uh, and, 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 and for the mobile base, you can actually, you know, configure um, um, user interface based on, um, you know, some of the um, icons, some of the, uh, I would say, way which you want your user to see uh, your information. Remember, you have a mobile, it's a small uh, interface, and it's not like uh, what you have in the computer. So you can actually um, tailor the, the interface um, specific for this uh, mobile um, data collection. But as well, you can also, uh, the app, uh, the DHS 100 app is also uh, evolved now to work with an offline analytics. Uh, within the tracker entity dashboard in terms of, you know, uh, showing you some of these uh, analytics um, uh, data which you have collected. <clears throat> yes, so um, as I said, um, the interface is different. Um, so you in the DHS 200 app, you can assign different uh, or different colors, different icon um, to your particular program. Remember that um, uh, at the facility level, at the web-based web -based system, you've configured different kind of programs that are there, but you know, uh, once these uh, programs uh, are accessed through the DHS 200 app, you can configure them to have a specific, you know, colors um, um, in terms of program but as well how uh, in, in, in terms of color, in terms of where, how you enter the information, you can also um, uh, work, work on that. So that's, um, that's, that's, um, that's one way. Then of course, um, um, you can also, um, um, use a simplified icon set to capture events or tracker as we have seen in this particular um, um, uh, second, second, second uh, interface. So that's one way of uh, looking at it. Okay. Um, and then, of course, the important part uh, is that, you know, the DHS to Android app uh, is compatible with uh, the already configured programs within the DHS to web, you know, however, uh, there are some a little bit of uh, some considerations which you need to kind of put in place 
when you are configuring your data collection mechanism through this Android app. So uh, the beauty about this is all the configuration, you can do it in the DHS2 uh, uh, web. And then of course, um, these configuration can be uh, pulled, um, um, all of them through the Android, uh, DHS2 Android app. And as I said, um, you know, it works with the aggregate uh, data, but as well as the event and tracker, tracker and tracker. So this is a kind of an example of, uh, you know, a program vaccination in a particular facility where you can see um, uh, different sections, um, you know, uh, data entry through different sections. And, uh, you know, within this particular app, it can actually give you a notification of, uh, you know, how many fields you have already entered, you know, if there's any notification to be uh, informed, it also kind of highlights, highlights here. So it's kind of a very intuitive in a way that uh, it helps um, the, the, the data clerk at the, you know, service, uh, point of service to actually enter this information. If they see that there's a missing value, they can actually go directly to that particular session, but also they will know that, okay, uh, I've already entered, um, um, you know, um, all set of information, which is, uh, currently required in this particular, uh, stage. So uh, another key feature is about, you know, collecting tracker data offline. I think this is uh, quite in, uh, important, especially in the de developing countries where the connectivity, um, uh, there is a, a fluctuation of our connectivity, but uh, on top of that, there are some places where the connection uh, is not available. So you can actually, um, you know, load, um, configure your system uh, and then start your application, load all this information within the DHS2 Android app. And then of course, you can go to the outreach uh, places where there's no connection. You can, you know, um, enter, um, proceed to enter your information within this uh, DHS2 Android app. Uh, all this information will be stored within the device uh, memory. Uh, whenever you have the connection, then of course, uh, this information uh, will be synchronized uh, with the DHS2 um, there. And of course, you can also even schedule this kind of a synchronization. So whenever um, at a particular point of time, then the, 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 the app will actually uh, see how they can synchronize this information. Of course, important part is that you all always see this uh, notification that, you know, there is some kind of, uh, uh, I'm not so sure if you can see this, but there's this uh, icon here, uh, this gray icon will kind of uh, show you that uh, there's data stored in your device only, and it needs to be synchronized with, uh, with, the, with the saver. Uh, once you sync, uh, it's synchronized, then this uh, icon here be, have, uh, now changes to green. So whenever you see this down, you know that your information uh, or your record uh, is synchronized uh, with the server. And, and that is the important part because uh, you, you want all this information within these uh, local devices to be synchronized uh, with the server so that all this information are put into one place and uh, the national uh, program people, they can work on this information. Or at the organization level, you can work with all this information from different sites which you are collecting. And then, of course, um, um, the uh, DHS to Android app is also integrated with the search and duplicate detection. That is uh, what we have uh, given you an example or some pre, uh, um, kind of, um, you know, how the, how, how the DHS to handles duplicates record. Uh, this is something which, um, which uh, DHS to also uh, Android app can also do that when you're registering into a um, a search and of course uh, um, uh, find any duplicate based on the set of uh, criteria which you have checked and as a uh, prosper said um, 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 based on the attributes um, and then of course we have uh, full support for the tracker entity dashboard um, as we saw in the web where you can have the profile uh, information where you can have you know the indicators the relationship uh, where you can um, add 
uh, some data, then of course, even in the uh, DHSO Android app, this is something which you can also see. So for example, this is the tracker entity uh, you know, dashboard where you can see the basic information of this particular uh, tracker entity instance. The profile, you can view more details. You can go to the indicators and check um, the, the indicators which have been created. You can go to the relationship to see the relationship which are available there, the notes. But also you can you know, um, um, either view the events which have already been occurred, entered, but also schedule new one and add uh, another one. Of course, make a referral if you want to make a referral. So these are um, uh, you know, information, or I would say kind of a track entity dashboard uh, on the level of a DHS2 Android app. And then of course, um, um, you can actually have a map view where you can review uh, your entities with coordinates uh, on the map instead of a list. So uh, the previous um, uh, um, um, uh, previous slide I showed you where you have uh, kind of a list of uh, your um, your entities, but here you could actually also review these entities uh, through a map, uh, see how these are and where these entities are, and also um, uh, the distance. I would say uh, to the um, I would say service provider, so you could actually see. Uh, where they are. And also, of course, uh, it allows you to capture location. And in the location base, you can capture, you know, these are through the device GPS, uh, but you can also capture, you know, as a point exactly where uh, either this particular uh, client stays or where that particular event occurs, but also you can track, you know, you can capture polygons uh, of that particular area. So that's, uh, that's kind of a um, uh, uh, way where DHS200 app works. But also you can um, uh, take pictures and read QR and barcodes for registration and searching. This is quite useful if you are dealing with um, uh, logistics where uh, some of these information are you know, stored in this uh, QR barcode instead of you know, uh, starting to enter all this information from scratch you can uh, uh, scan, uh, take a picture, read these uh, um, uh, barcodes, and then all this information or some of this information will be um, populated um, within your, um, your, your, your Android, DHS2 Android app. So this is kind of uh, an innovative way of uh, uh, fast tracking some of the um, data, data collection processes. Then of course, um, there is a way of uh, how you display your option sets. Um, um, so basically um, we can render these options within the app um, uh, you know, vertically, but uh, there was a need also to do this horizontally. And as you can see there, um, these radio buttons and checkbox, you can actually um, uh, render them you know, either horizontally or um, vertically, depending on the choice, uh, depending of course on the value type which you have, uh, you have choose, but depending on other criteria which are there. The most important part is that when you're rendering this um, uh, horizontal, just be careful about the number of options uh, which you have, because if there are too many, then they uh, start to cluster and it is much more neat if they're um, 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 going here, I would say uh, vertically. So uh, I think this is a part, partly about you know, the choices of, um, uh, of a design and see how the interface uh, will look like at the, um, at, the, at, the, at the data collection point. Then of course, we cover this about custom working list. Also the DHS2 Android app allows you to, you know, um, customize this, uh, this working list and the, um, and the, and the uh, health workers, for example, uh, will be viewing the list based on what you have customized. So either you can custom, uh, you can create a list based on the events which happen today or based on the events which they are assigned to that particular health worker so that they can monitor, you know, these uh, um, uh, profiles, I would say, or factor to instance, um, and, and, and continue with the data entry. So this is something which also at the Android base, Android uh, level can be uh, achieved. 
And then, of course, um, the local offline analytics in as accountants in dashboard. This is something which um, um, I hinted that uh, you can actually have this uh, particular um, uh, analysis. And this analysis can be either, you know, a, a bar chart, you know, it could be a line chart, but also you can have a more um, advanced level analysis. For example, these are child growth charts. Um, where you can track the uh, growth of a child from, you know, different stages. And if, of course, that particular um, child health is, you know, optimum uh, or not. So um, there's a huge, there's a different level or different ways of uh, visualizing uh, this information there at the DHS to Android app. And of course, through the track tenting instance uh, dashboard. So this is quite a, an important part because um, you know once you collect this information, uh, you'd want to actually uh, be informed uh, on some of the parameters which you'd want to um, to see. So, for example, uh, a, a very important use case was this of uh, seeing the progress of child health, you know, through these uh, um, weight uh, weight featuring age uh, charts, where you can you can chart and then also find the Z score and etc. Then, um, um, apart from the uh, data collection, DHS2 Tracker offers a number of visualization tools uh, to help you analyze your information because uh, the process, you know, the information process is you understand what you want to collect, you collect the information, you analyze this information, make a decision, and then continue with that particular cycle. So there's a number of uh, uh, visualization tools which DHS2 offers. Um, to analyze, to visualize your information and uh, help you analyze. So uh, it can range from tables, uh, I could go to numbers, uh, I could go to different charts like pie chart, um, you know, bar chart, but it could also be maps as well. So there's a different level of um, uh, analysis where you can do um, in DHIS2 once you have collected your data. Um, uh, through the um, uh, different mechanism, either through the DHS2 Capture app, DHS2 Tracker app, or the DHS2 Android app. So the important part to realize is that uh, this information, once you um, um, are collected at the individual level, they can be aggregated and provide a summary of your uh, tracked, uh, tracked data. And this is kind of uh, an example of, uh, uh, you know, um, um, uh, an information where you have uh, immunized, for example, uh, COVID first dose or, um, and the second dose. And then you can, you can see here uh, the list of uh, our facilities which are providing the services. But now this information is disaggregated, you know, by the number of dose, but also by the gender, male and female. And of course, you can get the uh, the total. So this is something which you can get uh, uh, straight away once you have um, um, uh, enter your information uh, within the DHS2 tracker. But of course, you can also create a, a, a detailed line by line report where you can, uh, you know, see exactly um, the information which you have entered um, and then, you know, monitor this information by a specific record. So this is something which you can, you can, you can do. Um, in DHS2 through uh, the, 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 the DHS2 uh, apps, but also you can, uh, you know, aggregate this information through the um, uh, program indicators, um, and then of course post them uh, uh, through the different, uh, through uh, other uh, visualization um, apps, for example, dashboard where you can have now at the programmatic level, at the you know uh, higher level, and then we can monitor this information that you know uh, across different uh, time, across uh, different parameters. So um, here is where the uh, importance of data collection becomes, where you can uh, you know uh, seamlessly um, uh, visualize your uh, your aggregate information um, and inform your managers of what is happening in the ground. Then, of course, uh, based on how you have configured your information system, you can always, um, 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 sorry, 
based on how you have uh, configured your, uh, your system, you can always get the reports based on certain uh, parameters or option set, I would say. So for example, here you have configured your system to uh, capture different uh, COVID-19 um, uh, vaccines, uh, Moderna, AstraZeneca, and et cetera. So as you know, data collection process continues, uh, you can have this information, you know, um, 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 have these uh, analysis based on, you know, um, uh, the option sets which you have, uh, you have uh, import, uh, kind of customized. So for example, here, you have AstraZeneca um, saying that, um, yeah, 4,825, and then of course, other, other vaccination as well. Then of course, you can um, decide to create indicators which use both tracker and aggregate data. And I think this is kind of um, a powerful way of analyzing your information because some of the information could be coming from the tracker, some of the information could be uh, coming from uh, the aggregate part. And you can use this um, combination to inform you better uh, or to create an indicators which combine this information and then uh, uh, give you a certain kind of uh, very unique uh, information. So you can triangulate or review uh, these uh, tracker data and aggregate. So for example, um, I can give you an example that during the COVID-19 um, uh, pandemic, had built um, um, individual COVID-19 surveillance system, but we also had a, a COVID-19 daily aggregate uh, data collection tool. So while Uh, I had a connection problem. I hope you can hear me now. Yes. So um, I was kind of um, um, going through this, uh, uh, creating an indicators using both a tracker and aggregate data, where first you have uh, your aggregate data here at the, um, you know, for example, your data set, population data set. But also, um, you have these. Uh, you're collecting this information, for example, for people receiving the first dose of a certain vaccination. And this particular person uh, was age 41. So once you aggregate uh, these individual data, you might combine this information into one, you know, your one analytical uh, favorite or one analytical report where you can see. Uh, the people receiving the first dose, uh, you know, um, um, in, in, in age 35 to 54, you know, uh, and we are assuming that uh, this particular person here with the national ID um, uh, MR005 will be, you know, part of this uh, particular uh, values here. And then you have population here, um, which is coming from the aggregate. And then of course you can create, or you can calculate the COVAC dose one coverage for people uh, aged 35 to 54. So this particular indicator will be combining uh, the tracker data, uh, which you've collected through this uh, either tracker capture um, or uh, DHS2 capture app or uh, DHS2 Android app. And then of course, um, uh, um, um, this aggregate data, which you have here as your particular denominator. Then, of course, um, you can apply different disaggregation. As you can see here, you have uh, different disaggregation for the lab results, either for uh, a particular way which you want to um, uh, display your information. For example, here you have uh, different age groups, 
uh, 0 to 4, 5 to 14, and et cetera. But here also you have a, a, a different age group, 0 to 5, 6 to 11, and et cetera. So you could actually um, uh, uh, decide to um, use a different uh, uh, way of uh, disaggregation your raw data so that you are you know, handling or addressing some of the different needs from different stakeholders. Then of course, um, you can um, uh, decide to review your data tracker across multiple program stage. Um, uh, this is just an example where we have different stages, stage one, clinical examination and diagnosis, stage three, lab results, stage four, uh, health outcomes. And as you can see in one particular pivot table, you can combine this information uh, from different program stages um, uh, and of course, review this information. So that's uh, one way, uh, a powerful way of uh, um, uh, accessing or analyzing your information. But not only that, but you can also map your tracker database on the location of data capture, uh, where the information has been captured, then you can track or you can analyze this information. But not only that, but uh, you can also, you know, map your tracker database on the individual location. When you are entering data, you could actually decide that uh, I want to capture the location of this uh, uh, profile of this uh, track entry instance. So you could also do uh, anal analysis based on that individual location of those uh, people. So that uh, becomes more uh, important um, uh, or more relevant uh, in, the, in terms of analysis. But um, apart from that analysis, uh, we also, the DHS2 have a, a robust web API, which allows um, different users, uh, administrators to develop uh, custom apps and access these uh, tracker, tracker data which you have entered. Uh, a good example is uh, during this uh, COVID, where there was a need to have you know, these uh, COVID-19 vaccination certificates. And there have been a lot of all different uh, custom apps which have been uh, developed um, uh, to, to actually access this information based on certain configuration and allow uh, these certificates to be you know, um, uh, available to the public uh, as well as those who have access within uh, the DHIS2. So there's an example here. Uh, from uh, uh, Ministry of Health, uh, Republic of Vanuatu. There's also here um, uh, another example. So these are just an example, but uh, for example, in East Africa, um, most of the HISP groups have uh, developed these uh, uh, custom apps to um, generate uh, similar COVID-19 vaccination uh, certificates. Not only that, but we have uh, an opportunity to also uh, have different use, uh, his groups to develop uh, some apps which are um, helping uh, or giving some other de detailed analysis which uh, the core DHS2 might not offer at that particular time. And uh, a good example is a uh, work from uh, Sri Lanka where they've uh, created uh, um, a relationship analysis uh, app where it kind of tracked, uh, for example, one case or one suspect how many contacts uh, have that particular suspect had, you know, um, how many uh, in that particular contact, how many, um, um, for example, for that particular case, how many contacts has been indexed as confirmed, how many are suspects, you know, and et cetera. So you can actually do a lot of analysis based on your particular, uh, particular, uh, particular, um, uh, particular apps. And this is just a an example where you can have, or you, you can see uh, one case, for example, uh, you know, being linked uh, or having different relationship uh, with different uh, suspects or even different uh, uh, cases um, and et cetera. So this is quite a powerful way of analyzing your information and make sure that uh, your, your, your data, which you're collecting stays uh, relevant. Now, uh, performance, um, there's a lot of uh, work which has been done in terms of performance. Um, optimization of the new tracker data importer to make sure that uh, you don't, it doesn't take a lot of time importing your data. Um, this is more uh, under the hood in terms of helping uh, the user to import as much data as possible uh, within a very short time. Uh, also, the tracker search engine has been improved in terms of, uh, you know, code efficiency, uh, removing of uh, bottlenecks which have been, uh, you know, hampering or making the search engine a little bit uh, heavy. 
um, improving the database query optimization, um, database indexing, but also the database logs contention improvement. So those are, are some of the um, improvements which have been done at the uh, tracker search engine. And uh, we have been getting a lot of uh, feedback that uh, now the tracker search engine is quite more robust, quite more faster when you're searching um, um, uh, the records there. Of course, the efficient API usage in the new tracker app, for example, saving entire event, not individual data values. Previously, we were being saving uh, each field one at a time, but now that uh, uh, um, it's not, it's been seen as not efficient. So now you're saving the entire record uh, and also helping with the um, uh, client side catching. So this is kind of an example um, um, uh, of the improvement which has been done uh, from version 2.34.3 uh, vis-a-vis version 2.34.4. And as you can see, there's an average response time in second has increased uh, 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 tremendously across different uh, 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 functionalities from the Android synchronization uh, to the search of our unique attributes uh, you know, to posting uh, enrollments, to posting events, and etc. So we actually encourage you, uh, if you are embarking on deploying implementation of uh, uh, a tracker use case, then it's better if you, you know, deploy the latest one because you'll be having all these features, uh, very cool features, but as well as the performance side as well. Yes, and then of course, uh, usually DHS2 has um, uh, two, uh, two cycle release. First one is in April, and then the second one is October each year. Um, we have uh, planning cycles prior to release uh, of the, the next uh, uh, phase. So for example, uh, for the release in October, we have a planning meeting in March uh, where uh, the team sits around and, and, and uh, come up with all these prioritization. And for uh, the uh, release, the first release, April release for next year, uh, then uh, the team sits in September. So it's really important to understand this and also to see how you can uh, advocate either the HISP group, which is near you, or through the DHS2 community that are some of the features which would want them to be uh, integrated or incorporated uh, within the uh, next release. So also, uh, so, uh, and then of course, um, the, the following slides, I'll be just presenting some of the upcoming features, which uh, are still in development, and of course will be incorporated in the uh, next release, uh, but some of them are not yet uh, are finalized. So uh, a good example is the new event report app, uh, which will be taking a more modern user experience and tech stack. Uh, and of course, this particular new event report will be following a similar look and feel as the visualization app. I'm hoping you are all uh, familiar with the new visualization app where we have put um, um, you know, pivot table and different visual, uh, 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 visualizations uh, into one app to accommodate that. So that's, uh, that's one of the uh, 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 coming soon uh, um, feature, but also the tracker entity analytics uh, where you can do a cross-program analytics. And I think this is something which uh, the community has been uh, asking for it for quite a long time. Um, this will be kind of a look and feel for the coming event report uh, overview uh, where you can you know, um, select your input dimensions here, but also you be able to drag and drop your dimension here as what it is uh, now with the um, uh, DHS2 uh, visualize, data visualization app. Then of course, the new tracker web UIE, your user interface, this is something also which uh, it's been worked on. So this tracker support uh, for the existing capture app. So um, um, all, uh, as I did itself, um, all new uh, tracker features will be uh, available um, in the capture app. So that's the trend where we are going, where we are putting everything into one place so that the user don't shift much from one application to another. And some of the main themes, you know, as you can see here, uh, including tracker entity centric dashboard, improved duplicate, record handling, line listing, organization unit and filtering, performance, and of course, modern user experience. These are some of the things which are, um, uh, will be worked on. Of course, uh, this is just an example of the tracker web app 
uh, where you have the personal dashboard with enrollment overview. So this will be quite different from what I've uh, I showed you previously, but this is where, uh, uh, where we are going now, where we have this information um, are populated here as the personal dashboard where you can see the profile. You can also see the enrollment information, but you can also uh, continue with your uh, data entry. So this will be kind of a, a little bit of a different view. So, um, and also you also have an enrollment dashboard with the stages and events, as you can see it here, um, uh, entering your stage, as you can see, but also getting these uh, errors and warning feedback, uh, kind of notification whenever you are entering your information. So this is kind of a sidebar having all this information. So the point is to make um, um, the data entry experience or the you know the uh, 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 the personal the tracker entity instance uh, dashboard as neatly as possible, but as informative uh, as possible. And then of course uh, the the process of duplicate handling. I think this is quite an important part where it will be also um, um, being um, researched and also kind of uh, being implemented. Uh, there's a lot of work being doing, uh, done here in terms of uh, making sure that um, um, the system can you know, automatically uh, flag if there's a possible duplicate and then ask for the administrators to handle those particular, uh, those particular um, uh, duplicates. Then of course, uh, line listing data entry. This is uh, uh, partly uh, something which has been handled within the enrollment dashboard. Uh, to allow the users to uh, to do this line listing data entry um, in the in 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 there. So um, just finalizing my presentation, uh, statistics from the field. Uh, just a bit of uh, examples. Uh, it doesn't mean that these are the old examples, but this is just an example of how the DHS2 tracker is being used. For example, for Bangladesh, you know, there's a, a measles and rubella immunization campaign where you have more than 400 100 sites, uh, more than 35 million vaccinations. So the system can uh, accommodate a huge number of events within that. And also uh, for Sri Lanka, we have, uh, you know, um, a COVID vaccination program where you have more than 60,000 entries per day uh, with a 16 million people tracked. So th this is how um, um, uh, robust the DHS2 tracker is, is in terms of you know, uh, being able to track as many possible as, 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 as possible. Uh, but also another example is from Rwanda where they've been uh, handling uh, COVID case surveillance, but also COVID vaccination, where they have around 100,000 uh, plus people per day being vaccinated, tracked um, uh, through the DHS2 um, COVID vaccination system. Um, you know, through around, and they have around 3 million targets by end of 2021. Uh, and of course, they have a target of 7 million by the end of July 2022. So that's uh, just an example of uh, um, how the DHS2 um, 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 tracker is being used across different uh, countries, but different uh, use cases. And just to end with my slide, uh, my presentation, um, you know, so when you're dealing with uh, individual level data, it's always about making sure you have a high quality of information. So um, the, the team is always uh, improving identification of duplicate records and making sure that you have a very robust search and matching uh, mechanism. Um, matching between different combination of attributes so that uh, it's much more easier to identify who these uh, duplication data uh, and all these uh, information uh, checking should be done on the background job for finding duplicates. And of course, the other part, once you have identified the duplicates, it's about merging these duplicates. So, um, you know, suggesting candidate for automatic merging uh, and also make it easy for the user to merge uh, these um, um, duplicates records uh, within your particular uh, system. Now, um, it's around the top of the hour. Um, we have gone a little bit, um, it's now 4.02 uh, East African time. 
Um, I know we started a little bit late, around 4.10 or 4.11. So I will welcome um, some questions uh, from the participants. Um, if you are around the participants, feel free to raise your hand and then we can unmute you. Um, just raise your hand, unmute you, we can unmute you. And then of course you can, uh, you can post your question here while we are reading uh, some of the questions which you might have posted um, in, the, in the Slack. Maybe Adija, can you take over with um, questions? Sure, thank you, Wilfred. I think we have a couple of questions in the chat box, but as well as on the Slack channel. So I would start with the ones that are in the chat box. Um, The first question is, when the Android is offline, would it be still able to use the feature of real-time historical data comparison during data encoding? For instance, looking at ANC first visit while doing ANC second visit. Any facilitator to respond to that? Yes, what's Yeah, I just wanted to inform them that on the online, when you're offline, a lot of the features, especially the features that depend on the on the database, unless if you're only using only one app, let's say one, the, using the, the tool on only one site, it can search its own duty. Sorry, Wesley, think... if you could get close to the mic, please. We could hear you from far. Wesley? Okay, so probably he's adjusting his mic. Uh, we have another question which is asking regarding the line listing, can we import backlog data from Excel? Facilitators, are you there? Okay, so no. regarding no the backlog data uploading, DHS2 supports uh, uploading of data, only that you just have to abide to the DHS2 format. And it's not exactly as Excel, but rather as CSV format, but it also supports the JSON format as well. So all you, all you have to do is make sure you follow the format or template of uh, Tracker data uploading. Yeah, so I think just to add on to that, I think on the App Store, there are also some apps uh, that assist with data import. I think like there's the, the Data's app. So those are also a bit more user friendly in terms of like allowing you to map some, some fields to to a, to a program. So I think they're quite assistive in trying to import uh, data into the, the, the DHS2 tracker. Thanks, Diwangi. Okay, another one is, can Android app hold on data for a relative long time if the server got hacked or if it cannot be reached due to different reasons? Uh, 
Hi, yeah. Adida. Okay, I can go ahead. Yeah, sorry, Adida. I have a background noise which comes on and also sorry if it comes on. Yeah, um, just to answer that and also look at the ANC first list and second list. So um the Android, as Wilfred explained, it's actually almost offline most of the time, but uh, uh, you can set it to trigger that every now and then uh, at the given intervals, it goes and fetches data from the metadata and data values from the server to back to the to the to the to the to the, to the device. So what happens um, in terms of storage, that will heavily depend on your storage of the Android, the Android phone, the Android phone. So the storage on your phone will limit how much data you can be able to, to, to store on your phone. So if you have, you know, a small memory on the phone, then you will not be able to store quite a lot of data. But also when you talk about hacking, uh, that would be also depend on what you've done on the other server. So if you hack, if there was a hack and you changed the, the, the whole server and pointed it to a different um, UI or instance, then you may not have issues in synchronizing the data. But otherwise, every time you are online, the, what the Android does is synchronizes both ways, upwards and downwards for you to be able to keep the data. For the facilities you are assigned to capture data and also uh, temporarily the facilities where you are allowed to be able to search uh, in, 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 in the entire organization unit. So that's uh, what actually happens with the Android. Um, so you can keep data as long as your memory is not full. But it's always advisable to keep synchronizing data upwards and, and downwards. Then, when it comes to the question which was asking about the on an Android offline and enjoying the off the online real time data, uh, this what actually happens with the Android for the tracked entities that you have access to. That is the tracked entities where you where where you are assigned to capture data. Every time you are going offline or you go online and synchronize it pulls all the data for an individual, say this man, pregnant woman was being tracked from first visit, second visit, the registration and so on. So all, all that will be uh, synchronized to your Android phone and you'll be able to have a complete record of that particular uh, uh, tracked entity or client uh, during your offline session. So you'll be able to see the first the, the entries in the different stages over time. And also, you will also be able to enjoy some of the program indicators and the visuals that you will be have synchronized and configured into your system. Over to you, Khadija. Thank you very much, Prosper. I think we have another last question, but from Prosper's response, I, I think it has already been covered. The question was asking on if at all the Android app is offline. So from Prosper's explanation, I think uh, the answer is clear that it, yes, it is offline as well. Um, looking at the time, I think uh, should end this session. If there are more questions, you can just drop them in the Slack channel. And we'll be looking forward to meeting you all on Starting from Monday, there are actual sessions now of the Tracker Use Academy. Of course, I'll be sending out uh, the Academy agenda and of course, uh, more details about uh, the session starting from Monday. Otherwise, thank you all for joining us today and looking forward to meeting you all on Monday. Thank you too. Thank, thank you. you. Thank